Thank you. So first, I just want to apologize for not being present for the morning sessions. Just so you know, I was uh, unfortunately unable to come earlier because it was Thanksgiving <laughs> yesterday uh, in the United States. So um, without missing Thanksgiving, I was able to jump on a plane, get here in the morning. And uh, I just wanted to, to, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, um, let you know how thankful I am for the opportunity to come here and get to listen to the rest of the speakers that I was able to hear, um, and also for the uh, ability to hang out with you all and get to speak to you now. Um, so I'd like to begin with uh, one of the credos from my lab. So I, um, at UW-Madison, uh, am the PI of the Brain Language and Acoustic Behavior Lab, or the BLAB Lab. Um, so we study how the brain controls the mouth to produce the acoustic output that we hear as speech. Um, so our credo number one is all language is body language, right? So our voices are produced by moving our bodies, um, which are physically interacting with the air that moves through them. So basically, another way to talk about it is as a pink trombone. If you're familiar with this website, if you're not, I highly recommend uh, you take a, a listen. It's a demo that allows you to see how shaping the oral cavity and nasal cavity um, allow you to create these different sounds which are synthesized on the fly because the air is uh, simulated as moving through this physical system. So to simplify it a bit, we can describe the vocal tract as a series of tubes uh, coupled together. So each of these tubes would have its own resonant frequencies, um, and those resonant frequencies are just based on physical properties of the tube-like length. And these resonances all combine to create a unique filter uh, for the sound produced in the larynx. So we call this sound the source, and this is basic speech science. The source filter theory of speech production says that the source from the vocal folds is filtered by our pink trombone, and then the speech output uh, is the result. So as an example of this, we can think about the vocal configuration that is required to produce the vowel ah. Um, so ah can be approximated by two tubes, a series of just two tubes, a skinny one that is forming the back cavity, the pharyngeal cavity of the vocal tract, and a fat one that forms the front cavity. And all an ah sound is, uh, is a vocal source passing through these particular tubes in this particular configuration. Um, so to demonstrate this, we just need a series of tubes of the right size and shape. And luckily, I found this fabulous resource uh, for this very thing on the website of Mark Huckville. Mark is not here, by the way, is he? I just, I really want to thank Mark a lot. If any of you know him, please, <laughs> okay, extend my thanks to him for setting up this website. So if you go to this website, you can find a tutorial for making your own vowel resonators from tubes of different lengths. Um, and I have done this uh, for, you know, <coughs> initially for my students, but I found it out to be a really great demonstration. So if you follow this tutorial, you can make a shape that approximates the shape of the mouth for an ah sound. And so uh, I've done this. And so here are my vowel resonators here. <laughs> So the simplest one is ah, just by taking two tubes, this fat one here and this skinny one here, um, we have a shape that's close enough to the vocal tract that if you played some sound through this, it would sound like an ah. Um, and you know, so instead of the pink trombone, we have the, the PVC pipe trombone. Um, my favorite way to show this is to use an electrolarynx um, because that is, uh, as many of you may know, the vocal source for many individuals who've lost the ability to voice with their own vocal folds. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I don't have an electrolarynx with me. And in fact, this is the same dilemma that I faced when I was due to give a demo to um, some children who were coming to the, the Wisconsin Institute of Discovery. And the person I was supposed to get the electrolarynx from uh, ended up leaving work early and there was a miscommunication. And long story short, I was left without a vocal source for my <laughs> filter. Um, so I needed to improvise and then I remembered um, that not only does an electrolarynx produce a, a nice buzzing source that if put through the filter would create these formant frequencies and produce these vowels in formant space, um, but a duck call would be another good <laughs> source that I could use. And then I thought, okay, it's Friday night and I have to be at my demo at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Where am I gonna find a duck call in that time? <laughs> And then I remembered that I had moved to Wisconsin. Um, so I discovered that in Wisconsin, you can drive about 20 minutes from the capital 
and be at a store like this, um, and you can buy something like this, uh, which by the way, I searched for a duck call for an uh, embarrassingly long time. I was pretty sure I was in the right place because I was in this aisle that's marked waterfowl accessories, <laughs> um, but I was unable to actually find a duck call, and I finally had to ask for help, and they said, well, it's not duck season, <laughs> so they're not. <laughs> <laughs> So this is just, you know, the mentality was really foreign to me, but we, we managed to communicate and um, I asked, well, what is the next closest thing to a duck call? And I was uh, pointed to this hooty owl locator call, um, which actually <laughs> makes the sound of an owl, but the point of it is to um, scare turkeys to um, make their own sound so that you can find them uh, and shoot them. So just in the spirit of Thanksgiving, um, I have the Strut Commander. If you, by the way, if you can't tell, this is the brand of this uh, Strut Commander um, Owl Locator Call. And according to the packaging, its realistic tone and volume will make the toms send shock gobbles every time. So let's see if it works. So what I'm going to do... Are we going to find out if there's turkeys in here? <laughs> let's see if they're here. <laughs> So what we're going to do is, uh, I'll just demonstrate what this sounds like on its own. Hold the microphone. Oh, that would be fantastic. Yeah. So I'll just demonstrate what this sounds like uh, on its own without any um, filter. <laughs> All right. I, th I think it sounds like a duck, actually. So personally, I'm not sure I could. I may not be have the skill to do this appropriately. So this is this is the um, sound without again without any filter. This is this buzzing sound that it's not too far off from the vocal source um, that we would hear if we didn't have any vocal tract. So, and then now with the vowel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so if you want an ooh and ah, we have an ooh here. Let's see if we can get the ooh to work. Right. Ooh. <laughs> okay, great. So, th thank you. <laughs> so the point of all of this uh, is just to remind you of, uh, as Sophie mentioned, the, the physicality of producing different sounds with your voice, right? It's body language. The brain needs to control the body to make different shapes um, and to produce the acoustic output that we hear as speech. So it's a bit more obvious if you think about a signed language, right? Like ASL or BSL, you know, sign languages are visual, so you can really appreciate the connection between this body movement and meaning. Um, it's easy to forget that it's just as important for a spoken language. Um, you still need to move your body. It's just that the primary signal is auditory. That's the primary result of the body movement that you're making. So that brings me to my next point, um, which is that, in the words of Tori Amos, um, I can hear myself talking. I hear my voice. So pretty much every time we speak, uh, our own voices are audible to us. And we respond to that sound. We modulate our voices in response to it. And the um, most obvious uh, effect that you can that can demonstrate this is called the Lombard effect. And that's just the fact that when you can't hear yourself, when there is some kind of noise that is masking your ability to hear yourself, you will increase your vocal effort. You will get louder, and you will change various other aspects of uh, your speech in order to hear yourself. You might think it's in order for your interlocutor to hear you, but that's not necessarily the case because you can be wearing headphones and they're not hearing anything and what, I can't hear you, right? You, you, still, you still unconsciously increase your vocal effort because you need to bring your voice to the volume where you yourself can hear. That's how you know that you are producing the right thing. Um, and just as a side note, humans are not the only species that have a Lombard-like effect, so you can find this in um, new and old world monkeys and in uh, beluga whales, and in songbirds, and not songbirds, and also children will also have this effect. Um, so this is actually a cross-species effect in modulating your voice to be heard by yourself. Um, the other way that we know that our auditory feedback is really important for our speaking is if you modulate one aspect of it, then uh, experimentally, then a speaker will uh, compensate. They'll adjust their voice to try to fight back against that modulation. So for example, you can just pick one acoustic parameter, like amplitude, and raise the volume of someone's voice. Um, and if they hear it as louder, they will lower the volume of their voice. If you take the pitch of someone's voice and change it, this is represented here by on this spectrum, uh, increasing the distance between the harmonics, then people will lower that pitch, or they'll, they'll do something opposite to whatever you're doing. And what I'd like to talk about um, for my um, 
first part of my talk today is what happens if you alter the spectral envelope of the signal which causes you to uh, have a percept of a different vowel. And that's indeed exactly the same resonances that these tubes are creating, right? So these tubes have certain resonances and those resonances are um, manifest as peaks in this auditory spectrum, acoustic spectrum that you hear as uh, auditory vowels. And so um, what we're gonna look at how manipulating those uh, is causes speakers to modulate themselves. So it's the first part, how does auditory feedback affect our speech output? Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about how you might still manipulate your speech output even when the feedback remains um, veridical. And you might do that because there's some other contextual reason, some other um, cognitive reason or perhaps uh, competition going on that causes you to have to modulate your speech. And we're gonna see quite a similar effect in that study. Um, and then uh, finally, I will talk about a um, experiment that we're actually just beginning, but just kind of show you a demo of uh, how visual feedback can actually guide people to modulate their speech. And then I'll talk about my art project. So first, we'll talk about how auditory feedback uh, is used in the production of vowels. So in this type of study um, that I think one of the speakers alluded to earlier, what we have is a participant who is speaking into a microphone, and they are told to say some words, such as the word bed here. Bed. Okay. And the feedback is then altered in real time, uh, or near real time, so that within about 12 milliseconds later, what actually comes out their headphones is something more like this. Bad. Okay, so you can hear the difference from bad to bad, or something that might be perceived as bad. So really what we're just doing is taking this spectral envelope here and changing the peaks in it without adjusting anything else um, in the signal. Um, and so what some past work has shown is that if you do this, for example, let's just focus on the first formant, that first resonance, the lowest resonance in the spectrum that is generated by one of the tubes in your body. Um, so if you artificially manipulate it by raising it, as in this gray arrow, or lowering it, as in this red arrow, and then you see what people do, and you compare their speech uh, in one of these shifted conditions to their speech when they are just speaking normally with their normal feedback, uh, you get something like this. So the zero line here represents the formant over the course of the syllable. So this is milliseconds uh, here. I think I've lost the, lost the time uh, axis, but this is milliseconds. So within the course of a single syllable, you can see there's deviation in the formant traces um, between the condition where you're hearing yourself with normal feedback and you're hearing yourself where your feedback is too high, as in this gray case, or too low in this red case. So you will lower or raise your formant uh, respectively within just a few hundred milliseconds to counteract that. And that makes sense because if you're hearing yourself too low, then the way that you would correct that would be to raise your formant so that once it goes through the transformation uh, here, then it would be correctly perceived as the um, thing you meant to say. And that really is the question. Is it, is it really just a, is it something about communication? Is it something about what we mean to say and how a listener would interpret what we say? Or is it more of just a reflexive um, effect about you know, the, the difference between what I produce and what I perceived? Um, it doesn't have to have anything to do with linguistics or, or categories. It could just be I produced something at 800 mels, and that's what I should hear. So to test that question, um, I'm going to tell you about an experiment I did a few years back where um, we actually manipulated whether the uh, shift caused a category change or not. Uh, and then the way we did that was actually just taking advantage of the natural variation in people's speech. So if you imagine this is a sample speaker data, utterances, each blue utterance, is a repetition of the word bed, and each red one is a repetition of the word bad. They had to see these words a lot. Um, so they would um, make these uh, distinct clusters, but with a lot of variability in each cluster. So again, this, this would be informant space, which is zooming in on this part of the F1, F2 <coughs> space right here. Um, so you might purport that there's some kind of vowel boundary between the two, so that at some point, if, if I took a production here and I shifted it and it crossed that perceptual boundary, then you would hear it as an example of bad. And if I didn't shift it uh, far enough, then you would hear it as bad. So of course, uh, if, if we were to do this and we just compared bigger shifts to smaller shifts, 
uh, you might still expect that you would get more compensation, more of a, of a corrective movement if the shifts were big, but that wouldn't tell you that it was anything to do with the category. It could just be because it's a bigger shift. So what we did was we looked at utterances that happened to fall in different regions of the distribution of, of variability of speakers' vowels. So for example, bed can be produced anywhere in this cluster, and it still sounds like bed. So if we focus on these ones that are produced here, farther from the boundary, and we were to shift them towards bad, if we were to take the formants in these utterances and put them more in the direction <coughs> of this average bad, then they might wind up still safely within the natural variability of the word bed. Um, so we can, by, by that metric, we can actually look at these utterances and use the same exact shift, so the same magnitude and direction, the same change in acoustic um, difference between what's being spoken and what's being heard through the headphones, and see if people respond the same way. In this case, when now the percept you would predict would be something more likely to cross the category boundary and to, pre to be perceived as a different word. Um, so are speakers compensating because there is some you know, amount of acoustic difference between what they say and what they hear, or are they compensating because the um, error signal that they're receiving is threatening to interfere with the message that they're trying to uh, get across to their listener? And we have some evidence for the latter, which is that these shifts, which remember are matched in magnitude and direction, so it's the same exact shift being applied to the feedback, are differentially compensated for if they wind up pushing you uh, over a category boundary. So this is if you look at counterbalance for which direction we're shifting in and for all the different vowels, but the red is showing you the compensation again over time, over the course of the syllable. Um, and the blue is showing you uh, for, for utterances that cross the boundary um, or that were near to the boundary and so therefore are likely to have crossed it when we push them over versus utterances that start out far from the boundary and so they're less likely to cross the boundary when we, when we push them over. So you can see that the compensation, again, zero would be a formant track for a unshifted word and you can see the compensation is greater uh, in the case where individuals are likely to hear a different word. Um, they're actually changing their, their, so in this case, this vertical uh, y-axis here is just amount of compensation. It's, it's not just F1 or F2 because it was a little complicated with the, the vowel categories um, being not at neat um, you know, right angles to each other. But we were able to uh, measure compensation. Um, basically, the amount of the change that they produced that was in opposition, direct opposition to the shift, and showed that that was greater in the case where they're hearing a category change. And furthermore, the um, this is an fMRI study, so at the same time we were recording the uh, brain activity while participants produced these words, either with shifted or unshifted vowels, and we were able to show, uh, to, to replicate this effect um, by Jason Torville, where we see these areas of auditory um, responsiveness when there is a feedback error, right? So when there is a shift compared to these <coughs> conditions where you're just hearing your feedback normally, we, we see this feedback error in these auditory regions as well as some frontal motor regions which we think are um, responsible for the updating of the motor command to make that corrective compensatory movement. Um, however, we see the same thing if we look at the near productions, remember these are near the boundary so they're likely to cause a category change and compare them to the far ones. So both of these conditions have a feedback shift. They have the same exact size and magnitude uh, direction feedback shift, but just these ones were more likely to be perceived as a category change and these ones were less likely. And we're still seeing more auditory error than in the case where you got a, a different, um, a change to your word. All the, all the words also that we chose were um, they were chosen to be real English words when they were shifted towards that other vowel category. So I think that this is evidence that we monitor our feedback not just for acoustics but for communicative goals, right? There's some influence on the, um, or by the linguistic structure that we've learned uh, as speakers that cause us to fight back more against errors that would intercept our message. Uh, so I think that's me. Um, I don't think I'm the only one who says this, but uh, th these results and others are, are showing us that acoustic targets uh, are influenced by these communicative goals. Um, so as uh, you've heard, one of the things that I am interested in is using the acoustics of our speech to reveal the processes that uh, underlie its production. Um, and so I'd like to do that in a way where I'm not going to alter the speech. 
um, but just use other uh, cognitive and, and linguistic effects to see if I can still find um, uh, evidence of, of the mechanisms behind speech in the acoustics. So the question really here is how can we use our voices um, to discover things about the cognitive and linguistic processes um, that underlie speaking? So speech is the result of many complex processes and the idea is that they leave traces in the speech output. So Matt Boldrick in uh, Northwestern University calls these phonetic echoes of cognition, which I really like. So the idea is that there's something in the speech signal we can measure that actually reflects what was going on um, during the speech planning or during the, the execution. Um, and you know, our speech is modulated by, uh, in immeasurable ways by all sorts of um, context and linguistic things. So for example, uh, subtle variations in, in the way that you're pronouncing words when you are speaking with um, an, an interlocutor with a slightly different pronunciation than you, right? So you, are, you tend to converge phonetically with uh, a, your, your fellow speaker. The social context is biasing your pronunciation uh, of words. The um, other types of interference tasks where you're doing something at the same time as talking um, causes changes in you know, the ability to maintain um, your pitch, the changes, causes changes in your rate, causes changes in your amplitude. Um, and emotional changes, you know, changes to uh, stress, for example, can change articulation patterns. So there are all these uh, ways in which speech is affected um, by these kind of meta-linguistic things. Um, so one of these uh, hypothesized mechanisms that would explain this is a cascading activation model. And um, that basically says that acoustic output is the consequence of um, multiple phonological plans that are, that are cascading down from sort of lexical retrieval um, to lexical selection, and then finally execution of these planning representations. So the idea is that if you have competition between, say, different lexical items, you're not sure whether you're <laughs> going to say one word or another word, um, then what actually uh, escapes your lips might be some hybrid of those two words. And I'm sure you may have experienced slips of the tongue like this where you morph two words together. Um, the same thing could happen at the level of segments. So two phonemes potentially combining. And the idea is that because these levels of activation are cascading uh, across, across levels, you're going to get potentially hybrid output at, that uh, goes down to the next level and down to the next level until you're producing that output. So one, some evidence for this is using tongue twisters um, to show that errors are not merely substitutions of the sound that you wanted to make with a sound that you didn't want to make. So if you look at uh, errors that are evoked by tongue twisters, the acoustic properties of them are actually intermediate between what you were trying to say and what you did say. So this is an example where um, speakers were trying to produce a voiceless uh, target here in green, right? So voiceless targets would have a long voice onset time, a longer VOT, um, like tuh as opposed to duh, which would be voiced. And the idea is that if you accidentally said duh instead of tuh, it was still a more tuh-like duh. So this red <laughs> represents the error here. So this would still maybe be categorized as a, as a voiceless, or a, excuse me, as a voiced consonant. So its VOT is very low, so you might hear that as a duh. But it's a ta e er da than the one you would make in not the context of that error. And you can find the same thing um, in the reverse. So when you accidentally produce something in a voiceless um, context and it's supposed to be voice, this is the target down here, it's going to be intermediate between the thing you were trying to say and the thing that you accidentally said. Um, so this suggests that this acoustic output is actually the consequence of you know, cascading activation of multiple different phonological plans that are competing with each other, and then they're realized as this intermediate production. Um, so just briefly, there's similar evidence in um, aphasia. So phonemic paraphasias also act this way, and they leave a trace of the original target in the error production. Um, so Karaski and Bloomstein here are making the claim that this is actually uh, not just a misselection of phonemic units, it's just something like a normal speech error, um, of course, abnormally frequent in the speech of people with aphasia, but it's just uh, a result of the co-activation of these um, 
target and competitors in your frame. So basically one thing, this competitor object modulating the way that you are producing the target. Um, so how can we more directly measure competition? I was really interested in this idea of competition between multiple speech plans at the phonetic level, and I was trying to think of a way to do this, and I thought of this idea of cognitive interference. Now, I'm sure that if I show you these words uh, and these words, this is going to be familiar to you. Yes, has anyone, mm -hmm. everyone in this room heard of the, the Stroop effect? So <coughs> this is the original study from 85 years ago um, mm -hmm. where these were the original stimuli that were used to show that you are a lot faster at reading these words, uh, excuse me, at naming the color of these words up here than you are at naming the color of these words down here. And that's because you have this competition between the red word, which is really more salient, um, that you need to suppress uh, in order to name the color. So participants took nearly twice as long to read that list um, because you're inhibiting this more automatic response. So one question that uh, I thought about was, so it's making you take longer to name the correct thing, um, but is it actually changing the way that you name that correct thing, right? So in, in the earlier studies I talked about, they looked at speech errors, and they sh showed that the errors were more similar to the target um, than non-error productions of those same phonemes were. So what if we look at correct productions in the Stroop task and we say, are those influenced in some way? So maybe you got it right, you actually were able to say the right word, but the fact that you had to inhibit this other word, did that you know, cause some mark on your speech acoustics? So how does the brain integrate these different streams of possibly incongruent information while producing speech? You know, do you just successfully inhibit one word and produce the other one? Um, or do you get a modulatory effect of these external cues, whether or not they're relevant, right? So in, in this task, I think as you know, you're told to ignore what the word says and you're just supposed to name the color. Um, so just to kind of give you a reminder too of how we have the task set up here, this would be the classic Stroop effect where these stimuli are congruent, you're supposed to name the color and they're all the color that they say they are and all of these are the incongruent ones. Um, but I want to actually go a step further and call these not just incongruent, but color incongruent, right? That's, that's what's incongruent about them. They have a different color word than, uh, th than the color ink that they are in. And then I'm gonna introduce a different category called vowel incongruent words. So these are words that were specifically chosen to share phonetic properties with the target color word, except they are crucially different in one aspect, which is the vowel. I had to cheat a little bit here with, because there wasn't a good word blee, and I wanted these to all be real English words, but they're, they're all real words, but they are um, as, as overlapping as possible uh, in the consonants with the, the target words, but they are crucially different uh, by this one vowel. So we call this, uh, I'm, like the in-house name for this is the street mm -hmm. uh, effect because we're changing the vowel there. So, um, you know, we, we, I like, tried to go with something that was a real word and was as, as much as possible. Um, and I thought if you had to pictorially show this, the task would be, okay, you have to name the actor um, that you see in the following photos. Okay, ready? <laughs> okay, so I don't know, I haven't actually tested it with these stimuli, so I don't know if this one works, but, um, you know, Meryl, now I'm going to think of her as Meryl Stroop from now on. Um, but anyway, so yes, if, if you were, if, if this font was easier to read and you were supposed to name this actress here, would you produce uh, her name differently because you're reading this um, incongruent thing? So that's really the task. Um, we, again, choose all English words, and then we want to know when people are producing correctly the target color, so red in this case, green in all these cases, and blue in all these cases, is there a difference in their pronunciation because they are seeing um, these, in, these different stimuli that are incongruent in uh, either a very specific phonetic way or just kind of very broadly different. We also just um, contrasted this with a neutral word reading task because we wanted to know how each participant produced these words, right? Like, so how, if they never said the word rad, I wouldn't really know where in their vowel space um, this vowel a is produced. So I wanted to make sure that I had a good target for everybody. Um, so I have all of these words and I'm able to plot them. This is for a given individual. I'm just plotting on um, 10 repetitions of each word in this form and space. 
Yes, they're changing their tubes to make all these different vowels. And um, crucially, I'm going to draw a vector between the target word and then the distractor word. So for example, here's red, and I'm drawing a line from the center of this distribution to the center of the rad distribution, and another line to the center of the rid distribution. These are the lines um, along which I'm going to compare the responses. So I want to know, are the formants that they produce, where are they along this line? Um, so we can come up with a, different, a couple different hypotheses for this. Um, well, the first hypothesis is just, does this work like a regular Stroop effect, right? Do we get a latency difference? So one kind of easy hypothesis to make is that we're going to get something in between the, the normal Stroop effect and a really fast uh, response for two congruent stimulus. So maybe the, um, the inhibitory effect, the difficulty in producing the word, maybe it scales with the mismatch between the target and the distractor. So if you have to say the word red, then maybe if you're looking at the word rid, you'll be a little bit slower, but not as slow as you would be if you saw the word green. So that's an easy hypothesis. Um, <coughs> let's talk about the acoustic hypotheses. Now, so we've got um, this vowel incongruent condition, and we want to know what's going to happen. One possibility is that the production will come out biased towards the distractor. So that would be evidence that irrelevant orthographic stimuli are integrated into the motor plan. So I can't help but produce the word red a little bit more like rad if that's the word that's on the screen, because maybe there's, again, this um, cascading activation of these two competing plans that are going to be realized in my speech as something a little more rad-like. Um, possibly, I could get the opposite. I could get a speech that would be biased away from the distractor. So if that was the case, this would be evidence of a kind of acoustic inhibition where the speaker is trying to avoid the pronunciation close to the distractor word. So it could go towards it, it could go away, it could have no effect at all, and that would be evidence that maybe this interference of seeing a different word would slow you down, but it otherwise would not affect the implementation of your speech production. Um, so let's look at the results. So just um, first, just to make sure, we replicated the Stroop effect for the uh, eight thousandth time here, so that's good. We had faster responses um, by over 150 milliseconds faster to the congruent ones um, than to the color and congruent words, so that was highly significant. Intermediate to the two is the vowel incongruent condition. So it's actually a lot like the congruent condition. There was only about a 10 millisecond difference. It was significant, but a tiny difference slows you down just by a tiny amount to see a different word uh, on the screen. It should be noted also that different word, it always began with the same letter as the real color word. Um, so it's, it's possible that if we had chosen our stimuli differently and maybe the initial consonant was different, I don't know if it'd be this fast, but we got a very, very fast response um, to the vowel incongruent words. Okay, so now what happens to the acoustics? Um, first, again, I just want to underscore that we're looking at how the productions change based on the uh, direction informant space that the competitors live. So here might be some um, typical productions of these three words, rid, red, and rad, in the neutral reading context. So this is just they're reading the word in white on a black background, and we're getting enough repetitions of them to get a good sense of where in vowel space they are. So this person, you can see, is changing both in the first formant and second formant between these three words, and this person is changing more in the first formant. So that's important because I want to know, you know, for this person, if they move in this direction, then that's going to be, you know, along this line. Um, if they move in this direction, it's partially along that line. So what I'm going to do is take the projection of their movement onto the line between their two vowels. Um, another surprise at moving to Wisconsin is that I got vowel spaces like that, um, <laughs> which I was not expecting, but you know, people have different vowels in Wisconsin. So I had to also account for the fact that some people really don't, at least in the average formants in the midpoint of the vowel, don't seem to distinguish between these two words. So it, it uh, makes the analysis interesting. Um, but no matter what their vowel space was, we drew a line, again, between the uh, distributions of interest, and then we wanted to say, did you change along that line? So if you change positively along that line, it means you got closer. Uh, go back here. A positive means you got cl closer, so if you saw the word rad and uh, your, 
deviating in a positive direction, it means you moved your formants toward rad, and a negative would mean in this direction, so the, the reflection of this vector here. So what do we see? People are moving away. So just to orient you, I have got these two words on top of each other for ease, but if you look, so the, the um, left axis here in kind of the orange color is representing the condition where they see the word rid, and so this axis uh, negative is down. This axis is where they see the word rad, and then this axis negative is up, just so you can see the differentiation between the two words. Um, so basically what we're seeing is that the, the projection of their change onto this axis is negative. This is the direction of from a to a, and instead they're going more the other way. So when they, when they see the word rad, this is where rad really would be in form and space, it would be down here. They're actually more above on average. Again, think of the zero line as just like in the um, auto, altered auditory feedback experiments, zero would be the neutral context. So that's when you say the word red and you see R-E-D on the screen. Um, so this is with respect to, all of these are the word red that are being produced. They all sound like the word red, but the ones that are being produced in the context of R-I-D on the screen, they are down here farther away from R-I-D. <coughs> farther away from the if vowel in phonetic space. Um, we saw the same thing for uh, green, and this is a little bit later, I think, so we aligned to the onset, and there's some more consonants going on before the vowel is starting, but we see, again, um, both of them are going in the negative, so the light color green is down, uh, and the dark color green negative is up. We see that they're deviating away. They're, they're moving, they're making this E more like a corner vowel. Um, in response to seeing these words. And then for blue, uh, we didn't get exactly the expected pattern because blow did what we expected. It went, in, it went away from blow, but bleed kind of went towards it. Um, so for when they pronounced the word blue and they saw E, they kind of went at least somewhat in this up direction. So those are the patterns. Um, they're broadly consistent. These are the, all the individual subjects, just to show you. And in particular, this rid, red, rad one, really stands out. Each pair of connected dots is one subject. And you can see that for just about everybody, their production of red when they are seeing rad is to the left, that is to say it's lower in F1 than their production of red when they're seeing rid. So even though these productions kind of differ with respect to the zero point, which is their, their neutral production, they're kind of maintaining this distinction. They're maintaining the fact that when they are in one context, they're producing the word less like that context. Um, so it seems that cognitive inhibition uh, of a printed word, having to ignore the printed word to say the color, is actually systematically biasing people away from that word. So they're producing something farther away. And it's not simply clearer speech, so it's not simply trying to um, maybe articulate their vowels more clearly because you actually, in this a eh case, a eh can get biased in one way or the other. So it's not just trying to, to make a more distinct a, eh, it's actually making it, you know, it's getting biased in the opposite directions. Um, so you might wonder, what about the regular Stroop condition? And I kind of forgot about it because I was so excited about the vowel incongruent condition, mm -hmm. right? What about the color incongruent condition? So I thought, well, I'm probably not gonna find anything because the words are so different from each other, you know, would you really produce the e in red less like the e in green if you saw green there because they're really different. So what we found uh, was actually the opposite. So mm -hmm. when we got, uh, this is someone producing the word red, and again in the context of green or blue, now you can see that both of them are going in the positive direction for each of the three contexts. So we seem to get an attractive effect when the color incongruent words were on the screen. Um, so you can systematically bias spoken acoustics away from the inhibited word, but only if the inhibited word is a phonetic competitor. So we're you know, struggling with this for a while, and I think we came up with a solution that makes sense. So our interpretation is, again, we, we have these different possibilities. One is that it's really a motor interpretation. So really, it is the um, a motor program is being inhibited. When you see that word rid, you say, do not execute motor program rid. And somehow that actually causes the motor program that is uh, affected to, to be, you know, maybe you would lower your tongue more or something because you're saying don't raise your tongue. 
So maybe the conflict or the interaction is at the level of motor programming. Um, the kind of more linguistic interpretation is that we're trying to increase contrast between these confusable alternatives. So then maybe the interaction is actually at the level of the phoneme. I'm not sure that we can really distinguish between these two. They're kind of, they, they could just be describing the same thing in different ways. Um, but one thing that they have in common is that they rely on the uh, distractor word being very close phonetically, right? For there to be a lot of overlap in the motor plans or for there to be the need for increased contrast, they, the distractor word would have to be pretty similar to the word that you are um, trying to say. Um, and then what we think is going on in the classic Stroop case is more like a classic you know, cascading competition. So in that case, think about it green or blue if you're trying to say the word red. Green or blue are not only words on the screen, they're actual valid responses to, this, to the task that you probably said like a second ago. So green and blue, you know, they, they are not phonetic competitors, we're calling them response competitors. They could be responses that you have to make. Um, and in fact, by far more of the errors happen in that condition, right, in the classic Stroop condition where you actually say the word green or the word blue when you're trying to say the word red. Um, so those competitors, we think, are acting in a very different way um, than these more phonetic competitors, which are never the right answer. <laughs> rid is not a color. You're never going to say the word rid. Um, we did see rarely errors of this type where the pr participant would say rid. Um, and that's really funny because it's, you know, it's in the opposite direction of the subtle, more subtle phonetic effect that we're seeing. So when they correctly say red, it's less like rid, but when they make a mistake, they say rid. They don't, you know, say rad. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we think that this is, this is not just competition at the, in, at, at, a, at the response level. So it's not like a response selection, it's actually something more at the level of uh, planning or at the, at the phoneme level. So another one way we tried to separate these two is to see if we could actually do this if we separated the inhibited stimulus, right, the, the distractor, and the produced stimulus in time. So to do that, we tried this priming type study where now all you have to do is name the color, and if you just saw this third square, it would be extremely easy. You would just say red every time, but we're preceding it by this word, which is either a congruent color word, an incongruent color word, or an incongruent vowel word that precedes it. We just have this little X's to mask it out visually. So this flashes on the screen, this flashes on the screen, and you see this. And when you see this spot, you have to name it. Um, we're still analyzing this data, but we're somewhat replicating what we see. We see this huge effect, actually, with green. Um, we see a smaller effect, but it's in the same direction with red, just to compare the two. So we're kind of broadly seeing similar patterns in the priming condition too. So it seems like it's possible to still get an effect even if you're separating out the thing that you're inhibiting um, and the thing, or the thing that you supposedly have to inhibit and the thing that you're saying. Um, so potentially it is actually something more like at a priming level rather than, uh, you know, legit uh, inhibition at the time of production. Because by the time you know what this is, this stimulus is gone. Um, and you, you, know, you should, shouldn't have to work as hard to inhibit it. Okay. So my conclusion from this study is that speech plans are modulated um, by competition and by contrast. So this is an implicit way that we are changing our speech, you know, probably without realizing it, but again, it, it ends up being in the direction that would make it easier for a listener to tell what we're saying, right? It's they want to make sure that I'm not saying rid. I really want you to know that I'm not saying rid. <laughs> so I'm going to bias my acoustics away from that. Um, and so it seems that even when they're told to ignore these words, they actually are systematically being incorporated somehow into the speech plans. And so the interpretation, again, is that maybe it's affecting the speech motor program um, because of inhibition of related motor programs, really mo a motoric explanation or because you're trying to increase contrast is the more linguistic explanation. Um, so then I quickly want to talk about a study that is just um, getting off the ground really in my lab about more explicit instruction and how that might cause people to modulate their uh, productions given visual information. So the question here is, 
people are implicitly modulating things all the time, can we actually train people to modulate their voices to produce target sounds? And the modality that we chose for this was the visual modality, give, giving people visual feedback of uh, an acoustic attribute of their speech, the formants, uh, to see if they could produce these target sounds. So uh, we're developing in my lab a piece of software that we're calling Voice Stick because it is a joystick for your voice. So it is a vocal joystick that allows a speaker to control a cursor, and the cursor is defined by, again, those resonances of your tubes, right, the F1, F2. Um, you can make it be other acoustic parameters, but we're, we're really interested in doing it in this two-dimensional vowel space. Um, so to show you, uh, this was the original uh, proof of concept of, of voice stick, is we have this F1 continuum from top to bottom, so E, uh, I, a, and a, and so if a speaker produced these vowels, they would see a cursor move based on the, the first formant that they, that they produce. So here's an example of what that would look like. Oh, yeah, these correspond, by the way, to these words. In real time, it's tracking the formant, and then it's showing on the screen what that value for the formant is. Uh, if it's a lower value, it's lower on the screen. If it's a higher value, it's higher on the screen. Okay. Um, so why would we want to do this? Uh, well, one reason that we might want to do it is if we want to train, use it to train people. So let me show you. This was actually the task that this person was per performing at the time. <coughs> So this is really being controlled by his voice. The left one is the computer. <laughs> okay, so he's not winning. He's not winning the game, but I think that he's doing a really, really good job, actually. I mean, this was really only the second trial that we uh, were working with. The other thing we realized really quickly is that this is a terrible game for this because you really have to keep your vocal stamina. Um, at least the way that I play Pong, right, is you want to track the, the, you know, track the ball as it goes up and down um, and try to stay in line with it. So that's very difficult to do. So we're, we're um, thinking about other gamifications of this type of system um, that could allow us to train a user to produce some particular combination of formants. Um, so for example, in um, a case where you know you actually wanted to make a training paradigm for somebody who had maybe less ability to use auditory feedback to be able to ascertain if they're hitting some target um, and you know be able to rely on the visual feedback instead. So for example, um, in a variety of um, communication disorders like aphasia, um, or you know, in accented speech, if you're trying to learn a second language, this potentially, this is why I want to use this on myself, um, to try to be able to, to hit those vowel sounds that I can't really distinguish auditorily from, from other ones. Um, so just to give you a quick, we're doing this in two dimensions, I've just got a, like a very quick demo of um, what it looks like now, so it's not really in game form currently, but we've just got a little, um, little snippet of yeah. Oop, sorry, I need to stop it. Yeah. So the target turns red when the cursor is entering it. It turns out formants are really hard to track online, so a lot of this has just been a lot of signal processing work to try to. Trying to get these formats smooth. Um, so that is the, the demo hot off the presses. Um, so we're working on this to basically be uh, used to give another feedback modality to allow people to, to modulate their speech to produce a target that they may not have an auditory uh, target for. Um, so just as a summary of these points, so we talked about how um, we monitor our speech feedback, not just for acoustical goals, but for communicative goals, right, that matter based on um, the phonemes that we're producing. We increase our contrast in the presence of phonetic competition, even when that 
competition is irrelevant, and there's really no other speaker there, but we're still increasing, or no listener, we're still increasing our uh, phonetic contrast with a potentially confusable alternative. And uh, tentatively, we can use this novel feedback modality to cause people to modulate their speech. Um, and just in the last few minutes, I do want to talk about, because uh, I have some time for it, this project that um, I do think kind of brings all these things together. It's, it's a project that I am uh, working on with my students for an upcoming exhibition at our university's museum, which is the Chazen Museum of Art. Um, so it turns out, as we've been talking about the ways that we're physically producing these vowels, we're changing the shape of our mouths and our oral cavities to make different resonant frequencies. Um, we're using our vocal tract as a, as a changeable tube. So it turns out that museums are also tubes, um, if you want to think about them that way. Um, you know, architectural spaces have resonances, and um, I'm not the first one to think about this in, in this way. Um, yeah, I was very inspired by the work of Alvin Lussier. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he was a sound artist uh, who did a lot of his most famous work in the 1970s, about 50 years ago. And there's a piece of his I really love called I'm Sitting in a Room, where he plays his speech into the room records that, and then plays that recording back into the same room, records that, does this over and over again, and what ends up happening is that the physical properties of the room, the resonances, just like in the tubes, they start to um, sum, so we get this additive property where the, the resonant frequencies of the room, think about it as the room's formants, right? The room is imposing formants onto the whatever source you put into it, and those formants are getting louder and louder, and everything that's not formant, everything that's not at the resonances, is going to die away. And so at the end of this piece of his, he does this, I believe, 37 times. You just, hit what starts out as his speech um, degrades, if you will, or, or is, is transformed into a chorus of these kind of ringing tones. They sound like alien wind chimes. Um, and I had the idea, there was a call for proposals for um, museum exhibits that really, uh, from, from faculty, that really captured the museum's uh, character and the exhibitions that the, were on the permanent collection and the space of the museum itself. And I thought, how can I not do this and write a proposal to do an art project? Um, and I proposed to do it with my students. So my students and I have been coming up with the text that we are going, that we've been recording in the museum. Um, and what we actually came up with is a variant on the rainbow passage. <laughs> Um, so if any speech language pathologists are in the room, you may be very familiar with um, what happens when the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air. Um, and we decided to actually reach out to some of the clients uh, from the speech and hearing clinic at the university and see if anyone was interested in, in partaking uh, in the project. Because what you might not know about Alvin Lucier, even if you know his work, is that he had a stutter. And that piece, when he writes about it, he says, or even in, in the text of the piece itself, he says, I regard this activity not so much as the demonstration of a physical fact, but more as a way to smooth out any irregularities my speech might have. <coughs> so he's actually using the acoustics of the room to smooth his speech and potentially to, to transform it, really, to modulate it in a way that he felt more comfortable with it. So we thought we'd do the same thing um, with someone who maybe had read the Rainbow Passage before for a kind of speech therapy. So we were um, lucky to find someone who was really excited about the project. Um, and her name is Shannon, and she came in and recorded this passage that we collaboratively wrote with my students. It starts out with the Rainbow Passage, and it segues into talking about how um, you know, like a rainbow, uh, which contains a spectrum of light, a voice has all these different, um, you know, frequencies in it, like a spectrum of sound, and we explain what's going on. And we went and recorded uh, Shannon, who had undergone speech therapy for uh, transgender, you know, surgery, and she recorded this passage, and we played it back in these different rooms in the Chazen. The other, the part for my students was, so they would understand that this is a property of the room itself, right? It's a property of the physical characteristics of the space that you're in that has the resonances in it. So we did it in these different rooms, and I'm just gonna give you a snippet. So the exhibition is in the spring, it's not done, but I have all the recordings already, so I can give you a little snapshot of what it sounds like. So here's one early on. You should be able to recognize the speech 
in this one because it's, I think, only the second or third time that we're playing it back into this room. So she just read this passage right here. And if you continue to do this, you get something more like this. So this is the same room. I'm just over at a different vantage point because I had to move away from the microphone because uh, I didn't want to contaminate the recording. So it sounds like this after, I think this is something like the 13th time or 14th time. example of a different room that we play the same sound in to start, um, but it has you know, different, different resonances that will be enhanced in the signal. Wisconsin between February uh, <laughs> 1st and June, I think. You can come and see this exhibit. Um, I'm actually hoping, I'm speaking with the, um, with Shannon who lent her voice to these recordings and we're kind of discussing whether we're gonna put it publicly online. If so, I can, can let you know. But the idea <coughs> would be to allow um, the app that we're writing to uh, have museum visitors interact with these recordings to be also public online for people to be able to navigate the different spaces in the museum um, and hear what voices are transformed into as, um, as their acoustic uh, environment changes. Okay. So just to close, um, I want to reference an American TV show. I'm not sure how many in the room are familiar mm -hmm. with this. Does anyone recognize this? character, okay, a couple, a couple people. So um, this is uh, a character from the American TV show Avatar, The Last Airbender. Um, and so what basically is happening in here that the show's protagonist has the power to bend the air by kind of elemental telekinesis. Um, and you know, if you think about it, I, I really like this because it's not that far off what we're doing when we are producing speech, right? We are, we are filtering the air, the air is coming through uh, our vocal tracks, and we are shaping it and filtering it as we produce speech. So we're really all airbenders, uh, mm -hmm. I like to say to, to my students. And then, you know, we've also heard about in the talk how the, the cognitive processes, the work of communication that underlies speech is also bending our productions, you know, towards or away from words that our, uh, that our listeners might be hearing. Um, so I just want to, again, thank you so much for all your attention. I'd like to thank the people involved in the project. Um, Rob Olson is working on the voice stick 2.0, the, the 2D voice stick. Um, Sarah Beach <coughs> and Swathi Kiran were uh, part of the Stroop, the original Stroop study. Um, Frank Gunther was my PI for the study on vowel uh, category boundaries. And Josh Mendel uh, has helped with, the, with voice stick as well. Uh, and to thank every, my funding sources and everybody in my lab that's helped out. And again, I'm very thankful for all of you. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you very much.